It's Alex Belfield on your favourite local radio station, and I'm joined by one of my favourite people, Richard Littlejohn. How are you? Very kind of you. I'm very well. Happy Christmas to everyone. You tell it as it is, and I like that. I do it, and then I get in trouble and I get fired. How are you still here and successful <laughs> when I'm unemployed? Um, you have to be a little more cautious on the wireless, don't you? I'm long enough in the tooth to know precisely what I can get away with, and I can honestly, hand on heart, say today I've never lost a libel action. I've never been dragged before a libel court. Ridicule, I, I, I tend to specialise in um, rather than rather than libel. I poke fun at people. I take the mickey out of them, and and that that can always be classified under the uh, category of fair comment, particularly when you look at some of the people who I am ridiculing. It's interesting, though, isn't it? I think you're only as strong as your boss, because if I read half of this on air now, I wouldn't be here tomorrow. Yet you can print it and get away with it because you've got the backing of the people you write for. The um, the newspaper market in, in, in Britain is rather more like the American talk radio market, where everybody has their own little niche, whether it be the Daily Mail or the Daily Telegraph or the Daily Mirror. There's a broad spread of opinion across Fleet Street, and uh, yeah, that's what we deal in. We deal in, we deal in opinion with so much... News has now migrated to satellite TV, to 24-hour BBC News, to the internet, that people are now looking for newspapers these days for for comment and fun. And, and what we must never do is we must never forget we are part of of the entertainment business. We, we, we have no right, no divine right to impose our view of the world on anybody. And, you know, I try and entertain. You know, I, I think there's nothing worse than, than poking people in the chest all the time because it'll just turn them off. I sense that you genuinely believe most of the things you say because there's a lot of people out there doing shtick now, aren't there, who are just saying things and making stuff up daily just to be outrageous. Well, I think a lot of people can spot a phony. It's not enough simply to be a contrarian. You know, I've been in, in the car column writing game for 20 years next year and i think that if people thought i was insincere or i was making it up or i was only writing it for effect i'd have got found out there have been a lot of casualties on this it's a road to basra my career and there are a lot of people who have fallen by the wayside there's so many targets that you've had over the years do you actually care about how they receive what you deliver well, not in the slightest. I mean, there's very little point in doing it if it doesn't upset them. I mean, the press doesn't have power. They talk about the power of the press. What the press has is the press has the power maybe to influence opinion. It has, it has power to upset those who have real power. The fact is that somebody sitting behind a desk in Enfield Planning Department has more influence over our lives than I do. But if I can make that man miserable just for one morning of his life and if as i know happens the wicked witch will get up at six o'clock in the morning scream at alistair campbell who then screams at the editor of the newspaper because i have ruined her day it makes me happy you're and, just a troublemaker just, yeah, really aren't absolutely, you absolutely yeah, yeah <laughs> someone's got to do it i've always described my my job as sitting at the back throwing bottles these people have got plenty of cheerleaders they've got plenty of sycophants they've got public relations people got entire departments dedicated to telling lies about how wonderful they are and i'm just that kid who stands at the side of the road when the procession's going by and singing the king is in the altogether at what point do you worry that it could actually impact on your future and is there ever a financial element that you worry that you may go too far and it costs you money no point because the, 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 what you can't do is you can't second guess people you can't you, you just have to be true to what you believe in now, I, I, I'm, I'm very small government, very hands-off. I don't like authority. The, the thing that the, you'll get from the book is I hate the sort of bully state that we've become, the surveillance state, the punishment culture, how in those 10 years under Blair, another 800,000 people are hired on the public payroll. Stop picking your nose, inspectors. You know, they would rather pay people these days to look through your rubbish for the wrong kind of rubbish than actually collect the stuff in the first place these people have got power they got more power than me they've got power to fine you two thousand pounds and send you to prison if you don't pay the fine simply because they won't collect your rubbish being able to come on a show like this is a privilege that is denied to people who sit in their own homes being angry i can be angry about it twice a week mm. and I, you know i've said you know it's what stops me wandering the streets with a kalashnikov firing at random <laughs> you know and to be able to do that is a form of catharsis but you know i know from the post bag that i get and people who've written to me about the book say thank god we thought we were the only people who thought like this because you don't get a lot of debate like this on the airways you know a 
lot of it, you know, from the political lobby and the, and the way in which the news programmes operate. They write about politicians as if they're proper people, where in fact most of them should be sectioned. Let's start about your childhood and, and how you became to be Mr. Angry today. I mean, were you bullied well, as a child? Mis- I'm not Mr. You are angry. angry. I'm, Come I'm, on. I'm outraged, but, I, but I'm <laughs> not angry. I mean, one of the things I do love, I mean, because you asked me what we were going, that's, that's you know, you asked me, and I, feel, I do feel passionately about this. I'm not inventing it. I'm not just saying this because it's a contrary point of view from the government. I, it is, what, something that is fundamentally wrong with our society. I'm outraged. I'm not angry. I mean, there's no point in, in being angry about it. I'm, I'd rather ridicule them. Because I think ridicule is is better than polemic. And although you, know, you can't do sort of funny sketches and what have you on, on the radio, not in a show like this, that's what gets them. That's what upsets them. When derision sets in, it's very, very difficult to get up from it. I think that's the point, isn't it? The public generally will accept incompetence or anything, but they won't accept being lied to being and lied being cheated. To, that's right, yeah. Are you a bit like me? You go through life going, is it me? For example, yesterday I came to London and I booked an open ticket. Now, have you looked at the Oxford English Dictionary definition of open? <laughs> this ticket cannot be used between 6 and 10 a.m. or 4 and 8 p.m. It's a closed ticket. <laughs> no. Is it things like that that annoy you as well, where you just go, how could somebody think of calling it an open ticket when it's not? I mean, I think that, I think there's a skit in the book at the, from one of the columns a few years ago when they transferred the um, British Rail booking system to Bombay. You know, it, uh, That's often the best way to do it, to do a parody of a, of a call centre or, or something. <laughs> but it's just, that it seems to me that, 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 that government and business is a conspiracy against the paying customer. And politics is a conspiracy against the voter. At what point did you make the decision, though, that you wanted to go the way you've gone today, where you tell it as it is and you, you have an opinion? Because most journalists choose not to, and therefore they don't stick out. You do stick out, but you're also living life more dangerously, well, aren't you? Well, I've always tried to tell it. I mean, the, my background was as an industrial correspondent in the Midlands, in the car factories and the miners' strike. And I've done that for donkey's years. And I always try to tell the truth about these people. You know, OK, the, the, the reporting was fair. But, you know, I, I would slant it in the way that left people in no doubt whatsoever where I stood on the thing. And that's fine. And you could do subsequent comment pieces. I did the 87 election on the Neil Kinnock bus. I mean, Ali Campbell was on it as well. You know, it was great. You could always see he was going to be a PR man because Ali was working for either Today on a Mirror at the time. And Kinnock would make a complete blunder and fool of himself in the press conference. And then Ali would come out and explain to us what Neil really meant as we sat there rolling around the aisles of the bus, of the bus you know, thinking the new clanger headline the following day. For those hard of thinking listeners, you're not talking about the guy from UB40, you're talking about Alistair Campbell. Absolutely, Alistair Good. Campbell. Just the, to the, check, the, yeah. very, the very one, the great man himself. <laughs> and after the 87 election, I, you know, the, the Labour had lost again. It was their third defeat on the trot. And I thought, there's no point in being a Labour correspondent. They're never coming back again, are they? Which how wrong I was. But in, the trade union thing was dead. And I mean, I was right about that. I mean, that's not, you know, apart from the isolated, you know, wildcat tube strike. There's very, you know, the, the unions are no longer a force in the land. And so I was at the Evening Standard in London. I went to the editor and said, look, I need to do something else now. I've done this for too long. So he said, well, come and write a few leaders, you know, editorials and... Uh, couple of features and uh, and uh, what happened was one day hunter davis was writing a wednesday column for the evening standard and he went on holiday and john said well why don't you do hunter's column for a couple of weeks while he's away and he never told me to stop and hunter's a friend of mine you know we're fellow spurs fans and and, and that was the that was the foundation of me as a columnist and a couple of years later i went to the sun kelvin came calling then went back to associated newspapers and mail between some 94 and 98 back to the sun for a few more years and I'm now two years in back at the mail where I intend to stay it is fascinating how somebody takes a two week holiday and you've got a career I mean if that hadn't have happened maybe you wouldn't be sat here it might not have done or if in those two weeks I'd I'd screwed up you know I'd, I'd be Sort of standing out in Great Russell Street outside the TUC with a notebook and a trilby. And of course, the interesting thing about this business is that if you'd had a different editor who didn't like your style, you might not have got through either. It's it just is important that you you have. I mean, you made the point about different bosses. It is absolutely fundamental that you, you know you, you, you're on side with your editor. It doesn't mean you agree with everything that's in the paper, but you wouldn't work for an editor, you know, for whom you don't get on with, or a newspaper who's political view or at least you know cultural view of the world you don't subscribe to and i've been very lucky john lease was the, the late john lease was the editor who gave me the chance and i've you know i've worked for two of the giants of fleet street in kelvin mckenzie and, P- and paul dacre and i've been very very lucky to have that kind of support
Do you ever struggle to think of things to talk about in your column? Only twice a week. <laughs> on uh, on Mondays and Thursdays when I sit down to write it, and because I've been a, a hack all my life, I can write. You know, I, I can I can construct a story. There are probably only seven stories in the world, and, and it's you know it's like they say there's only seven ideas for a play or a novel, and it's what angle you come at them from. And I'm all, I'm always trying to think, you know, am I going to do this as a polemic or? Say maybe there's a you know there's a new piece of lunacy in the police force. Well, you can either say, "Oh, isn't this outrageous?" or you can say, "How would the Sweeney have dealt with this?" You know, and you can put Jack Regan into the modern <laughs> into the modern Scotland Scotland Yard setup, or you know, the Northern Rock banking crisis uh, recently. I covered it from the perspective of the run on the bank in Dad's Army with with <laughs> with, with, with Mr. Mannering and the gang barricaded behind the. Bar- I was not. Not what, not not really getting to grips with what was going on, and you see, you make the serious point, but you make people laugh. It comes back to what I was saying: we're part of the entertainment business. You know, we we have to earn people's trust. We have to earn that audience. Well, we're coming towards the end now, and and I don't want to get too personal because I don't want to offend you, Richard. But there is a chapter in the book, and I bet I'm the only journalist to pick up on this, where you confess that you're homosexual. Is this correct? Well, I hadn't realised I was gay. You know, I was I was about 45 years old at the time. <laughs> and then the scales were lifted from my eyes by an organisation called Mesmac, based in Yorkshire. they just got a £74,000 grant from the lottery and 800000 from the health authorities. And they were always looking to expand into uh, new territories. And I read that a, a highly trained Mesmac outreach worker had observed that there were a notable number of married men at a men-only sauna. And it um, and we, we, he complained to his bosses, and I, let me quote from this, it's worth doing, it's from their publicity material. He said, these men were not accessing health promotion information. No, but this was clearly evidence, according to Mesmac, of latent homosexuality. And, and consequently, it spent tens of thousands of pounds on an advertising campaign in local newspapers and places where men gather. <laughs> this is this was at places where men gather. To say, come out, confess your homosexuality, <laughs> and we can help you. That I have to say, I didn't see many in the gents at the West Stand at White Hart Lane, but uh, so there I was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is this is crazy, absolutely lunacy. Before we go, we should talk, Richard, about what's on the tip of your tongue at the moment. What's really winding you up? What always annoys me perennially at this time of the year is where that local authorities do their best to stop us using the c word. Now, by the C word, of course, I mean Christmas, which has been banned by town halls up and down the, ca- the country on the grounds that it offends other ethnic minorities. Those happy holidays. Now, I have never met a member of an ethnic minority who has a problem with Christmas. Do you know, uh, Kareem, who runs Tandoori Nights, and I exchange Christmas cards. I exchange Christmas cards with my Jewish neighbours. You know, he hasn't got a problem with it. And this, all this diversity thing, it's not the minor ethnic minorities themselves. It's purse lips, self-righteous, self-loathing Guardian readers, and they, they loathe British culture. And that, at this time of year, is what really, really gets my goat. <laughs> Richard Littlejohn's new book called Little John's Britain is in your stores now. It's a great read and it's one of those holiday reads. I think you're going to do big business with this where you sit and laugh at stupidity. And it is one of those where you couldn't make it up half of the time. The stuff that you write, you wonder whether you've just sat there going... Blah, 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 blah. And presumably this ridiculousness will never stop. Every day there's another person creating more Well, I hope nonsense. not. I hope not, Alex. Otherwise you and I are out of a job, aren't we? <laughs> Kings of ridiculous. Richard, thank you for talking to me. Happy Christmas.